mean? Yeah, we'll just. Well, I think this might be all that's coming. This is about what we had uh, at the first meeting that I was at. I will start off with uh, an introduction. My name is Steve Soika, and I kind of volunteered to re-head this back up to uh, Jeff, uh, who's the Sartell Drug Free Coalition friend that doesn't know more or less than doing it for the video purposes for everybody out there in the, uh, in the media land to uh, learn what we're doing here and what we're, uh, what, why we're here and that kind of thing. Uh, but I want to apologize to anybody that was here last month. I literally thought it was the next day, and so that's why I was all the way out west in Western Stearns County, and I completely missed that meeting. I will tell you that will never happen again. So uh, I apologize for last month's snafu on my behalf. So, uh, so what we want to do is try and we're, we're having meetings every Tuesday, uh, the first, second Tuesday, second, second, second Tuesday. Tuesday of the month. We're trying to be consistent with that for anybody that can come and. One of the reasons that we're having this is uh, it's, it's mandated by the school through policy to have a drug-free coalition. There is a student group, which I believe they changed their name to Target. Is that correct? They are the Target group. So they're called the Target group. Uh, we will be getting with them and meeting with them. Uh, uh, but the idea behind this is to have a collaboration of, uh, of law enforcement, uh, which is represented here. We have Robbie from Sartell Police Department and, and Leslie from the Drug Task Force. I am work actually at the Sheriff's Office in Stearns County. So uh, medical, if we can get them here, uh, school resources, uh, uh, like to see business. You know, we got to get maybe after some of the businesses here in Sartell especially to come in. But it's supposed to be a collaborative effort between uh, all of us and the students, uh, just to educate the students, uh, to, to uh, teach them, uh, you know, it's definitely not a dare class by any means, but it's to try and teach them about choices and, and more so at their high school level. And, uh, and even though it says drug free, not every topic's gonna necessarily be about drugs, it might be about drinking. My understanding, and Robbie can probably back that up, uh, is that the problem right now, it sounds like in Sartell, is maybe more vaping. Yeah. A lot of vaping lot of going on either at school or after school. or um, And if anybody knows, I, I only caught bits and pieces, but I think there was just a study a week or two ago that vaping has probably been determined to be uh, not as good as they thought. Uh, there's some chemicals and stuff in there that uh, obviously you can take in. So so that is kind of the idea behind the group. Uh, I know it's a general uh, thing of the group. Uh, Tonight's, uh, tonight's topic is going to be uh, canines in the school. And the reason we thought of this topic or we came up with this topic early as we could in the school year is because the school is going to uh, be doing dog sniffs uh, uh, quarterly. Is that the deal? That's the deal. So We can't keep waiting for when they're going to occur. So, <laughs> so, but so we, are, we are doing one thing different. The high school has been doing that um, yeah. for the past couple of years, but we're also starting it at the middle school this year. Yep. Okay. And, you know, so there's always, for my... And maybe I should back up. So my experience, I obviously work at the sheriff's office now. I'm the sergeant at the sheriff's office. I was the drug task force commander where Leslie is now uh, for uh, six years. Uh, so I, I feel like I'm pretty well versed in the world of drugs. Um, I've done a bunch of presentations regarding that, uh, anywhere from 10 to 200 people. Uh, you know, so I think I'm kind of well versed in the whole drug uh, culture and world. But I do know that one thing that always seems to happen is there seems to be a little bit of resistance met by. Uh, by, and maybe it's apprehension more than resistance, but uh, by parents, by uh, um, people in the community when you bring dogs into a school uh, to sniff lockers. Uh, so we're just gonna go over a little bit, really all this PowerPoint is, because I'm probably like most of you don't really kind of tune out on PowerPoint. So we're not gonna do a big extensive PowerPoint. There's no uh, live videos or anything. But our topic tonight is gonna be canines in the school. I wanted to do it early in the season because they're gonna be doing it quarterly. Uh, we brought in Matt Mayers from the Sheriff's Office. He has uh, a drug dog that's uh, uh, just a drug dog, basically. That's the only thing that our dog is used for in Stearns County. It's not a bite dog, it's not a apprehension dog. It is a shepherd um, yeah. and a big one, but, uh, but he's friendly, so. Um, Unless you have drugs on you, so. But uh, at any rate, he'll explain a little bit about what that dog does, uh, a little bit how the dog works as far as the odor of the drugs and whatnot. Uh, as far as the PowerPoint goes, and I have for handouts for the people that are here, if you need one, uh, if you're a school representative, you probably don't, but the policy basically that allows the dogs to come into school. And, uh, and that is, I would assume, adopted by the, uh, the school board to start with, uh, you know, after some discussion. And it is applicable and it relates to uh, the Minnesota statutes. And I'm not gonna make this a case law class. We're not gonna go into federal search and seizure, search warrants and all that stuff. But, um, 
but we'll, we'll go over a little bit with, uh, with that and then we'll have Matt just uh, talk a little bit about uh, uh, the canine program a little bit. Uh, he did bring some drugs that we'll hide in here just to do a live demo. Uh, have you hit those yet? No. No. Oh, all right. Do you want to? Yeah. Sure. Well, if you want them to hide so they smell, yeah. that's fine. So, um, but anyway, so that's that's kind of what we're doing. Uh, the next meeting that we're having is on November 13th, uh, a Tuesday, obviously, uh, 6 o'clock here. Try to do them always at the Sartell Middle School. So anybody in the community, and again, I'm talking for the benefit of the, of the video cameras in here, uh, please try to come down and, uh, and you know, and, and learn what's going on uh, at these meetings, but also to, uh, uh, you know, to, by coming here, you kind of show your kids, you show the community that you, you are supporting the program, you're supporting them and their choices, and you're supporting, uh, you know, having Sartell kind of be a drug-free uh, community. Um, so uh, we will uh, probably go into the PowerPoint, get that kind of boring stuff out of the way. This won't be an overly extensively long meeting. We don't have the other thing for everybody. We know you guys are busy, so we try to do them at 6 o'clock so you can kind of get here on your way home from work. And we try to keep them to about an hour, if that, just so that we can uh, um, get you guys back out. I know there's sports and everything else that happens, uh, and so we try to be consistent and we try to do uh, all that uh, to, to make it easier for you. So. There's some drug hiding going on as we speak, so. I'll let him do that and then we'll talk. So. Yeah, it might not be a bad idea to introduce folks so they kind of oh, you kind of have an idea. Uh, yeah, uh, we do have a top council down. member here, so I like to make sure people know. And that I guess I just well. sat here and talked about myself. So yeah, if you want to go around the room, uh, also there is a sign up. If you didn't get on there, please do that uh, with the email so you can get on our email list. The worst that happens is you just get an email uh, once in a while from us to tell you when meetings are. So but go ahead. Uh, Ryan Fitzum, Sartell City Council. Rob Lyons, school SRO, middle school. Brenda C. Central High School. Sarah Volker, parent. Jenny Wall, parent. Eric Dozak, youth and family middle school director at Celebration. Leslie Patterson, the current commander for the Central Minnesota Violent Offender Task Force. Lisa Kramer, school board member. Cindy Andrew. Bethany Benning, parent. Hi. And Jeff Sweet, school superintendent. Matt Mary's ever for the sheriff's office. And Kurt's having fun going to play with your kids. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so um, we'll, we'll just go over uh, the, the policy again a little bit. Um, I should say thank you to the video people there from Bitstream Productions. And I, they're here on, I think, their own time just to do this. So I appreciate that. And I think the school district appreciates that. So, so this is the boring stuff. This is kind of what we sit through in law enforcement a lot of times. So. Um, this is literally just the, just the student policy, the school policy uh, for everyone. Uh, again, there's copies there that you can take with you if you have any more questions or whatever. Uh, but the purpose of the policy is to provide for a safe and healthful educational uh, environment. Uh, so, and this, as you can see, is a lot of lot of reading. But uh, pursuant to Minnesota statutes, this is what's important. This is what seems to always be an argument I've found in law enforcement. Uh, when kids put their stuff in a locker, um, or they even, I don't know if you have to rent them here necessarily lockers, but I know there's been schools where you sometimes have to rent a locker or a lock or something. Uh, they deem that to be kind of their their property, and then when law enforcement comes along, it's going to be a reason for them to sniff that particular locker uh, and, and go into it. There's always been that expectation of privacy. This isn't quite the same as your house. Uh, you know, we, we, in law enforcement, we do need a search warrant to go into your house. We need to have probable cause, that type of thing. Uh, that is not necessarily the case. That's the biggest thing to probably take away from this whole presentation uh, is, is that the school lockers are the property of the school district. And so uh, um, they never relinquish control of those, quite honestly. So the kids can decorate the heck out of them uh, like they do in the school year, and they can trash them, and they can, uh, well, they can't trash them, but, uh, um, you know, make them a mess. And uh, But they still always belong to the school, and that gives the school the right to bring in the police dogs and uh, and do the searches and 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 or if you know if Robbie had developed some information that there's something a gun or something uh, God forbid in a locker that he can go into that locker uh, and and search it so um, uh, probably this is probably a little bit the personal possession of the students within a school locker so if they have a backpack in there uh, the school does have to have some type of uh, again reasonable suspicion. Uh, 
I'm going to take a guess that that could be as light as uh, just some students saying, hey, so-and-so came to school with a gun, it's in his backpack, and it's in his locker, and, uh, you know, obviously a drug dog is not going to sniff out a gun, so that would be a situation, though, because of the healthful and, and uh, educational environment where the school could go in there with, <coughs> you know, Robbie could go in there and, and search that, so. Uh, desks. Uh, Again, it probably doesn't apply necessarily to the dogs in the school. When these guys do their, their canine sniffs, uh, um, I had talked to uh, Dale Strufford, the assistant chief in Sartell. Uh, his intention is to get several dogs uh, to go through the schools, the middle schools, uh, so that uh, um, you know they kind of get through there kind of efficiently also because uh, the schools are big and, uh, and the dogs do get tired. It's a lot of sniffing. So, so I don't think the deaths are necessarily going to come into play uh, in a, as far as a, a drug dog goes, but uh, um, again, there's the broke down what was already in that last um, uh, paragraph, and it should be a violation of this policy for students to use lockers for unauthorized or to store contraband. So uh, right there is just a, a violation of policy if there is something. So. <coughs> And this just describes pretty much what contraband is. Um, and then personal possessions. One thing that's, uh, so here's kind of a, a definition of reasonable suspicion and then the scope uh, of it. Uh, and this is kind of what, they, they took this probably from state statute because this is a little bit like what we do in law enforcement uh, as far as um, reasonable suspicion and, and probable cause. Uh, they obviously don't have to worry about probable cause in the school. So, um, but you can see here, and that's just what I was saying. Uh, school officials' personal observation or report from a student, parent, or staff member. Uh, if a student's acting suspicious, uh, um, you know, if there's a, a, you know, we have a school resource officer up in Holingford. We have some kids that just repeatedly seem to be in trouble, and, and then they get kicked out for a while. They come back to school, and they start acting kind of suspicious. That probably would be enough reasonable suspicion for our school resource officer to, to to search their belongings when they come to school and, and whatnot. So, um, and then reasonable scope uh, obviously is in, intrusive. Uh, I would assume that the school does not want to be very intrusive. You'll never see any strip searches going on of, of your kids. They're never going to do anything like that. Uh, it would be limited more to going through the locker, uh, going through the, uh, the um, backpacks. Uh, you know, and my assumption is that if kids are going to have drugs or something illegal, it's going to be more in their backpacks or in their jacket pockets than uh, just sitting on a shelf in their locker uh, uh, or in between some books or whatever. So, I'm sure I'm going the right way. So, and this is kind of important to know too. They don't necessarily need a drug dog sniff to come in here. They can, I mean, if they decide they just want to get a bunch of the teachers together and law enforcement and just inspect the lockers, they can go through the lockers at any time. So, um, again, I think what happens is students definitely, because they're there for nine months of the year, uh, kind of take that as this is kind of my spot or whatever to do whatever I want with. And, and then, uh, you know, and sometimes the parents, I think, believe that. And so they, Again, that's been my history with it in, in 27 years of law enforcement. There always seems to be that argument that you didn't have the right to search my kid's locker. You didn't have the right to search my, my kid's belongings. And that is obviously not true. So, um, so there's what it just talks about the, uh, the strip search. They, they could do one, but I wouldn't be surprised in this day and age if, if anybody was uh, subjected to that. I think if it got to the point where you thought you had to do a strip search, the police would be called and you'd probably be taken down to a police station or medical facility and, and have that done uh, there, not in the school setting. So, But it is on the on the paperwork, it's on the policy that you guys can take home, just so you guys know. So, um, And then just uh, the seizure of it. Obviously, it's, uh, the school will seize it and uh, turn it over to uh, Robbie uh, for uh, further investigation and to get rid of it and, uh, and to go from there. So um, here's a bunch of the, the policies, the statutes, and, and things like that. If you so are desire, will be on that handout. You can certainly look it up and read more about it. But uh, um, and obviously the discipline that goes with it uh, is in, in line with the student discipline uh, policy uh, that is uh, in place. So. Uh, could include all those things that are up there. So, so that is very short, uh, just kind of going over the policy. But I, again, I think the thing that I wanted to drive home because of my experience is, uh, is the fact that the school owns those lockers. 
the school can call the, the, the police at any time to search those lockers. They can search those lockers and then the, in the backpacks if they've got you know, good information from a student or a teacher or, or whatever. And, uh, um, and that when they set up these, these details with the canines, they can do that. They can bring them in and uh, uh, I know we also, as a sheriff's office, I think we've got some resistance uh, out on the West End uh, from a high school where we stopped doing it for a while because it was believed that we couldn't. Um, it might not even been in a policy back then, but uh, uh, in this day and age, I would assume that everybody's got a policy about searching the lockers uh, for safety purposes. So. And one of the things I want to make sure is clear on that is if we do the search, it's done at school and it's in the locker and there's been no search warrant issue, that is a violation of school policy. So all the punishments come from school. Yep. If we have the suspicion that someone has something else that may need to be more than that, we won't do the search. We'll call and get a proper search warrant. We don't have to let anybody get into that locker during that time. But that's the difference between whether or not we're doing it and even um, Robbie obviously is there as our SRO has some of that uh, ability to do it, but it's that search warrant that makes it more punishable by the criminal courts than it is if we just have the search. So, question. So, when I was in high school, cell phones were just coming about, but we still knew when uh, law enforcement was on the campus. How do you how do you control that now with Apple watches? Everything else. Well, let Brenda tell you. Brenda can tell you what we do when we know they're coming. Because number one, go ahead, Brenda. You do it better than I do. Let me start. Yeah. Go okay. Ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, number one, we try to not. We don't want to. We don't want to know. I don't want to know when the search is going to occur. We just would like it to occur during a certain hour. They walk onto campus, and then we lock down the kids into the rooms that they're in. We don't let them just all of a sudden, oh, the police are here, so why don't you run to your locker and grab whatever you need, head out the door. So they do stay in their classrooms because we don't let the dogs search kids. So if they have a backpack on them, the dog's not going to go search that student. If they have a backpack in their locker, we can check what's going in there. So we try to keep all the kids away, let the dogs go through. It's really important. I know I heard this from one of the law enforcement that, one school announced, well, we're going to have a drug search in three hours. Well, that doesn't really... Remember the purpose for why I, as a superintendent, and I've told this to our board a number of times, why I support this, I want to drive it out of our schools. I, I'm not really... Cons I, I wouldn't mind catching some of our kids because that sends a lesson, but more than anything else, I just don't want it to be in our schools. And so if I can just get that message, you don't bring it to school, that's phenomenal. Um, but we are getting kids that bring it to school. And so we need to send that message a little bit louder that we need to get that stopped. So, sorry. So as a prescriber of controlled substances, I've heard these stories where kids take their, their own Adderall to school and they will sell off the pills for $5 or stuff to people for performance enhancing on tests and stuff. Um, similarly for benzos. So, what is the penalty if they bring their own medication in their backpack? Is that still illegal? Yes. Well, and maybe I, maybe I should let the school people talk, but I believe that aren't they supposed to keep that in like a school nurse's office where it's dispensed? They're not Correct. supposed to have access let to it. Bring it. Even they, in high school? They yes. have to. They, okay. They're not allowed to have any kind of medication unless we have um, doctors. If, it, if it's a controlled substance, we have to have doctor's orders. Um, with our on file in our nurse's office, and then they have to administer that to um, to the student per the prescription. And any other kind of medication, even if it's over the counter, there needs to be uh, parent permission signed that students can have that in their locker as well. Mm -hmm. Because that is true. I, that was a while ago, but we did have a case when I was on the drug task force where a kid was selling his ADHD medicine to kids at school. That, you know, it's for five, ten bucks a tablet. Yeah. It's amazing how common it is. So my understanding is it's supposed to be in the school uh, nurse's office. I would assume that would also be a violation if you're caught with that. Uh, I don't believe the drug dogs will sniff out legal medication, controlled substance. They're not trained for that. So if there's a bunch of pills in a backpack, 
you know, that would come more from some kid saying this kid's selling or whatever, and the school resource officer would have to do a search and figure that out. Uh, so, um, but yes, it's supposed to be in the school nurse's office, uh, and locked up and then dispensed when they're supposed to dispense, dispense it. So, uh, yeah, he, he does tell, uh, that did happen to us uh, when I was on the drug task force. We were going to go to a high school out in the county, and they announced that at 1 o'clock there's going to be a, a big drug dog search, so make sure all the kids are locked down. Well, they announced that at like 10 a.m., so, you know, <laughs> the kids had, that we, we had information that the kids were uh, putting uh, drugs in Cheetos, in the little Cheetos bags, and they're walking around in the hallway and just sharing and selling it uh, at this high school. So we're going to bring in drug dogs, and the school principal kind of announced that. To, gave them three hours notice that they're coming. So we canceled the operation, obviously, but uh, um, but yeah, so that's something that, yeah, they, they and you know, and, and bringing the drug dogs isn't to catch the kids, as Jeff said, it is, uh, you know, I guess if you do catch somebody that is bad and doing that, it is obviously a deterrent to kind of make an example of somebody, but, uh, but there is some enforcement part of it that the drug dogs are coming in, but it is definitely more, I think, in the school setting, for sure, prevention. It's, you know, if he's doing a traffic stop on I-94, that's for enforcement purposes. That's not necessarily prevention. But coming into the school, the kids seeing the dogs, not knowing when they might come in. They could be in today, and they could be in three days from now. You know, or it could be 30 days from now. Uh, it's just a huge, uh, to me, it's I would think of a prevention thing. So, um, and it's you know kind of a byproduct. There, the dogs definitely don't know that they're doing that. So, um, and Ryan, just to follow up on your question, and when we've had. Um, the drug dogs come through the high school when the um, when the canine units pull up, um, turn into the parking lot. We know about what time they're are, sure. they're coming. We announce that um, that staff needs to keep students in the classrooms and that a canine search is about to commence. So they keep everybody there and and then it's probably three four minutes after that that the dogs go through. And I helped at the one at the high school last year, and it went pretty smooth where everybody, I think there were five dogs that mm -hmm. came in. Uh, yeah. We pulled up right in front. Everybody got out, went right into the school. Uh, if I do remember correctly, I think there were like four or five kids that decided to run out the back doors. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but there's nothing you can do to control that unless you have people stationed outside. Yeah. So. But we also have cameras, so we know who they are. Yeah. <laughs> and they did come if back. I had to to kids. That's smart. <laughs> Don't most children carry their backpacks with them throughout the day? No. Um, they do leave them in their locker. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. How, like, is it common that kids are doing this and you're catching them, or is it not? Do you know, do you know what I mean? Like you're saying, they're running out, and when we moved out of Morrison County, because there was, like, so much meth, and every newspaper article we read, we knew the people somehow, and... So that's why we moved out of that a few years back. And I'm just curious, like, is it like a big thing or you're just really focusing on prevention so it's few and far between? We're the, focusing on prevention. That's good. That's good. Yeah, I don't know that it's, it's not a huge problem with the, the kids all using drugs. In fact, it sounds like uh, from talking, to, I didn't talk to Robbie, I talked to Dale, but uh, I think you can confirm that vaping is actually mm -hmm. probably the problem more so in the middle school and high school. and. And again, like I was talking earlier, there's this new study that that's been found to be just as bad as the smoking cigarettes, I think. So um, based on the stuff that's in the oils and whatnot. So um, I think that's their problem. And that's obviously something that we would talk about the education piece with the, you know, again, it's called a drug-free coalition, uh, um, but it's not just going to be drugs. So we'll talk about drinking at some point. And, but we want to focus on, instead of everything all at once, uh, we definitely want to narrow it down to what is the problem? If the problem is vaping right now, then we're going to kind of attack that and talk about it. Uh, it switches to uh, um, you know, marijuana, then we'll work on educating on marijuana and that kind of thing. So. I just got informed that there are marijuana gummies that you can buy. Oh, they yeah. look exactly like cannons. Yeah. Yeah, it's. We get like daily updates in law enforcement about the stuff that, I mean, there's always stuff that people are changing and trying and, you know, and it's. Yeah. Sometimes I wonder, it just perplexes you with some of the stuff that people do. But yeah, the, you know, and, and, and obviously Leslie could attest to this, but we're not a uh, legalized state, but Colorado is, and uh, um, that's probably our biggest supplier of, of marijuana that gets brought in internally now, not from Mexico like it used to. You know, that was always a big thing. Um, it's all brought in from the United States because it's, you're here in the United States. So, but I think there are people that go out there by 
gummies and worms and cookies and brownies and they just haul that stuff back here and, and sell it. So. In fact, I believe we had, uh, was it last week? Uh, where was that? We were running for student council and we made pot brownies to get everybody's vote. So, in one of the schools here in Stearns County, it wasn't covered or so. Yeah, I'm trying to remember where that was. How many of those holding for it? I don't know. But uh, anyway, so uh, it didn't last long. So, but that's that's something that you'll do. And there you go. So, so I think with that, I'll let. Uh, if you want to talk about how the dog works, uh, you know, off the scent and that kind of stuff, there's. Uh, I'm sure there's some science behind it. You don't get really in depth about that. And then we'll go get his partner. And uh, he did hide some drugs in here for everyone that's over here. So. All right. Um. My name, is, my name is Matt. I've been with the Sheriff's Department for like 13 years now. Um, I've got Canine Eddie. He's a German Shepherd that came over here from Slovakia. Um, basically, when the trainer got him, I did two weeks of training with him, just me and him, on proper searching. Um, so basically, the dog came here. The trainer had him for a few months, did all the introduction stuff with him for drugs. Um, once the introduction stuff was done, I got introduced to him, and then we did our two weeks of training. Um, the easiest way to describe how it works is everybody's, I'm sure, smelled a skunk in here. Um, just driving by when you get that odor, you can tell, hey, that's a skunk. Well, now all of a sudden you hit a skunk, you get that stronger odor, and it's like, wow, that's really bad. Basically, Eddie works kind of like that. His senses are so much better than humans that, you know, when he smells a drug odor, he's like, pow, there it is. Okay, that's it. And he gives an alert. Um, dogs are different. Um, Eddie's a passive dog, so. Up here, when he does the searching, he's gonna get an odor, and you'll see him kind of circling around, and all of a sudden, he'll get to the source of the odor. So basically, it's the strongest point that he can get to and smell the strongest odor coming from, and he'll lay down, and that's a passive, a passive alert dog. Um, they have other dogs that are called an aggressive alert, where they'll sit there and they'll scratch or bite, and um, basically kind of destroy what's holding the drugs, trying to get to it, letting you know they're there. So. The sheriff's department specifically went with the passive alert because they didn't want that damage or they didn't want to have that issue um, come up on traffic stops or school searches or home searches and stuff like that. Um, but up here, uh, I just put a little marijuana, kind of dug it in and tucked it in the boards there. Um, but wherever anything is, whether it's in here, in a locker, in a backpack, um, everything's going to give off an odor. Um, it's going to sit there for a little while and it's going to eventually give off odor. Um, lockers it can vent a little bit different um, like up in here if there are fans running in the room it could circulate a little bit different so we could do different things um, but like with the past school searches that we've done um, and talking with administrators and everything if he alerts on a locker generally what we have people do or recommend is that search the one next to it on each side um, just because if there's odor in the middle one it could be coming from a side one depending on how everything's venting up um, so it's really I think it's really neat to see him work, and I guess you guys will get a chance to see that as well tonight. Um, I haven't had any issues with him. He's been pretty reliable. Um, he's pretty fun to work with. So, and so maybe you said this, and I completely missed it. Do you know like how much stronger is a dog sense of smell than say our? In general, it's roughly a hundred times stronger, and that's just why I use that skunk reference because I think everybody's driven by a skunk, you know, and they get that ooh, that's kind of smelly. I'm sort of older versus like. If you'd hit it with your car, all of a sudden you get out of your car and you're like, oh my gosh, that's really bad. Um, so, like any time a dog is going to smell those drugs, where um, I'll just use marijuana as, as an example. We're going to smell it, but it's not going to be the simple odor, as strong of an odor. Um, if it's been in here long and this room is venting right, Eddie can pick it up as soon as he comes in the door. And when I bring him in, he might beeline it right for it. Um, otherwise, if everybody's sitting in here, he might get a little excited or he might take a little bit of time to circle around and find it on his own. So, most times when we're in a room, I'll take him off a leash and he'll search the room on his own. Um, he can do it ten times quicker on his own than having me kind of drag him behind him, trying to keep up with him. Um, but just with all the electronics in here, I don't really <laughs> keep him on a leash when he's ready for that. So, cool. What about synthetic stuff? Um, the only things he's trained for um, right now is cocaine, heroin, uh, methamphetamines, marijuana, ecstasy pills, molly, and there's one I'm having a brain fart on. Um, I can't think of it right now. 
but the major seven illegal drugs he's trained on. Okay. Um, they can be trained for other things too, but those are the ones we focused on because that's what we're seeing most of. Yeah. That was my question. Is that what the school is likely to have, those types of drugs? Just from our school searches that we've done in the county area over the last two years, most of what we've seen is marijuana. Um, there are the pills, but Eddie isn't the only pills he's really you know, keyed in on is the ecstasy pills. Um, but as far as like the prescription pills that there's, that are in lockers or on kids, we, we won't be able to find those. Uh, I can just think in holding forward, um, holding forward in a few of the other schools, anything we've found has been smaller amounts of marijuana that's all been handled internally uh, to the school kind of, let's say, punishment system. So. Would you say that the majority of your work um, is not in the schools, but with the regular drug task force type work? Um, I'll say 1% of my work is in the schools. Um, most of the school systems, we let them know we have the dogs, so if they want to do the searches, they're available. Um, we don't go around to the schools and say, hey, we want to come in and do a search. Um, all the schools kind of determine whether they feel the need to have a drug dog come in and do the searches. And the only reason why they're coming in, it goes a lot faster than having the teachers go through every locker. Um, if you have a, a row of 100 lockers um, and there's drugs in one of them, um, we can search that within a minute or two versus having the teachers go through every individual locker and just go through everything. And I think I happened to be up at the high school last year for a meeting. I was coming up for a meeting and that's when everyone was going into confinement, so I barely got in the high school at that time. But was fortunate enough to be able to watch. And if I remember correctly, did you do place drugs kind of as a test? Um, if we have an open locker, we'll usually do it as just kind of a... Like for Eddie, if I do all the sniffing with him and he doesn't ever find anything, he gets really bored. So if I go into school and we never ever find anything, um, he'll get bored with it and he won't search as hard. So um, I believe it was, I'm not sure if it was in Sartell, but we generally will bring something in and if there's an open locker or a garbage can kind of by the front doors, um, what we'll do is we'll come in and then we'll just put that on the way out so when we're done with our search, the dogs can come up, sniff that item, do their alert, and then they get rewarded for being in the school system. I know we're running that into the jail. I've gone up into our jail quite a bit to do searches and he starts to get bored because sometimes he'll find something, sometimes he won't. So now it's like when we go up there, we just got to incorporate a little training into it as well to keep his drive going to go in there and search for things. So, Because he's pretty much reward driven, correct? Yeah, um, I'll bring it in with him. Basically, he's got a ball, um, and it, he only gets it when I know he finds something. So it's just, you know, okay, he'll get it tonight because I know there are drugs there. But he'll go around, he'll sniff. Um, basically, um, how do you put it? He's like a two-year-old kid on steroids. It's a lot of energy, <laughs> a lot of drive. Um, he'll drag me through the door probably because he's so excited to be in here looking for stuff. Um, but he'll run around as soon as he gets some, he'll lay down, he'll stop and look at me, and that's when he'll get his reward. So it's basically a big game for him. So every time he does good on his game, he gets his toy and he gets to play. So. How many school districts do you search? Whoever wants us. Um, we've gone out of the area. Um, I've gone to New London, Spicer, Wilmer. Um, Holding Ford, Sox Center, uh, Melrose, Cold Spring, um, Kimball is going to try and set something up with us this year. Um, so it's basically whatever school district wants. Um, I know our department's been really good with allowing us to go outside to different um, schools that aren't within the county to try and help. And basically like everybody's been talking in here, it's more of a prevention. It's more of to, hey we found it, don't bring it into the school. Um, I've never found such a large amount of anything where the you know a teacher goes in and searches the locker and they found a pound of marijuana. It's like okay, now that would have to be handled a little bit differently. Um, but everything's been kind of just you know smaller amounts, personal use stuff that we're finding in the schools so far. So and it's it's more you know. I'm not saying kids are afraid of the dogs, but they hear the dogs are coming or they come into the schools. Um, here and there, on random basis, they're less likely to bring it into the school. So, do you? Oh, I'm sorry. Do, uh, well, and I'm trying to remember back. I think we did this a few times. If you, uh, if a dog gets on a locker and you go in the locker and 
maybe find a small amount of marijuana. Do you guys go out and then search the outside of the car too that the kid drove? That's yeah, a lot of times these kids will, uh, you know, obviously keep the big amount out in the car in the parking lot where they're not going to get caught with it. They just go out at intervals to get the stuff. And I remember we did that. And of course, if a dog hits on the car, that's a whole different. That's search warrants and all that stuff. But we've got kind of the reason to go to that car is because we found a small amount in the kid's locker. Um, because I know that does happen. They do. And what I found for some schools is they also have in their policies for parking lot permits or however they run their parking lots that you can't keep guns, knives, drugs, stuff like that in their car as well. Um, so if your school has a policy towards that effect, technically you can go through and sniff the outside cars on the school parking lot property. So it's just kind of, it all depends on how much you want to get into things, but definitely if you find something or have an alert on the locker, um, is if you can find that car in the parking lot or if the kid is willing to bring you out to the car, um, you can definitely do a sniff on the exterior of the car to see if there's going to be any number to anything in the car. Is there any rhyme or reason to the four times a year? We've only done it once a year the past three or four years, I think we've done it. So. Okay. And I know in Holdings Ford, they do it twice randomly throughout the year. And I think it all just kind of depends on how, how proactive you want to be as a school district to show that, hey, we don't want that stuff in our school. Um, so Is it, it, it a all, to the school district? Um, as far as I don't know. Um, a lot of us as dog trainers or dog people, um, it's good work for the dogs. It gets them out. It's exercise. It's playing their game, basically, and it's good exercise. So there's no cost that we pass off to the school or anything. Um, if anything, we modify or shift a little bit just to come in during those hours, um, kind of do our sniffing. And a lot of times, I know after Sartell that year, uh, last year when we got done with our sniffing the school, we all went and continued training for the rest of the day. So it's a good chance to get the dogs to get used and train with them as well. That was, I, was, I was wondering the same thing though. If students know that it's happening once a year and it just happened, is it a free pass the rest of the year versus Hey, we anticipate it being between four and six times a year. If one time it happened, if next year it happens once, so be it. But that <laughs> never, uh, never knowing, always guessing mentality. Yep. Yeah. It's and it's that's why um, I guess when it comes into the planning phase of everything, um, you work with one person at the school. That way, it doesn't get spread out or somebody lets something slip and saying, "Hey, we're doing it on this date," and then everybody knows. Um, so it's more of kind of picking and choosing the days you want to come in randomly. You may do it just once a year, but you plan on doing it four times a year. Or you do it three times this year, once next year. It's just keeping it mixed up so there's no set pattern for everybody to get used to of when you're doing them or when you're not going to do them. How long does it take you for a school average time period for? I think last year we were done in Sartell within 20 minutes. That's awesome. Yeah. So it, it's. And that's Very all efficient. the lockers in the hallways and the locker rooms. And then there's a few storage areas, um, instrument storage, and some other places that we have them go through too. So if, if we'd have fewer dogs, it would have taken longer, but I believe we had five of them yeah. that day. Um, so everybody just kind of went off with a teacher and you had your kind of bank of lockers that you'd search. Um, you mm -hmm. basically just walk down your lockers if you'd alert on one. Um, you just you know remember the number or pass the number off to the teacher that you had with you. And then later they would go in and search the locker and kind of handle everything else if they found anything internal. <coughs> you had mentioned that sometimes it's held internally within the school. The parents still gets to know about it, correct? I believe that the school notifies, would bring the child out of that <laughs> class. <laughs> um, and just, just from holding for that, they pulled the child out of class into the front office. Um, they notified the parents, the parents came in, they sat down, had a conference, and said, hey, here's the deal, we found this in your locker, we're handling this within the school department, um, and here's your suspension, or expulsion, however the school decided to handle it at that point. And generally, once the school kind of has that conference, we'll usually take the drugs to destroy them, um, just so the school doesn't have to worry about what to do with them. Do 
It depends. I mean, um, the one I'm holding for last year, he admitted to it. Um, they just dealt with it all in the school system. And I believe he was suspended for a number of days. Um, I think up there they have kind of a, you get one chance, if it happens again, you know, sorry, but you're expelled. Um, so it's, some kids admit to it, some don't. I mean, it's pretty hard to say, well, that's your locker, there's stuff in your locker. Um, they could say that somebody else ultimately put it there, but in the long run, it's ultimately their responsibility because it is their locker. Um, and then it would be something that a decision would have to be made at the school level as to how they wanted to handle it. Depending if you know, you have your straight A student that's never been in trouble before, if all of a sudden you find something in their locker and they claim it's not theirs or somebody put it there, um, versus somebody that's been struggling or has had issues in the past with their, uh, having marijuana, um, that would be entirely dealt with in the school system and that decision would be made. Good. So, and we'll get them then. Okay. I'll be the filler while he goes out there. <laughs> so, you know, a little bit, uh, again, we've got two of two dogs, like uh, we got Matt's and then another guy that works on our midnight shift. And, uh, and uh, you know, and they start out a little slow because they, they do when they're new, but uh, we've had them for uh, a couple of years now, I think. And, uh, and they've been doing some pretty good things. Our other dog just got three pounds of meth on the interstate by uh, Melrose uh, last week. Uh, I think it was last week. Uh, or the week before, but anyways, it was just literally off like a tail light was out or uh, something like that was the start of the stop, and then it just progressed and progressed, and uh, and so the dog uh, dogs do have their value. I mean, like, you know, finding three pounds is a lot of meth. Uh, you know, St. Cloud is kind of a a regional distribution center, I guess, if you would, and it kind of gets dispersed to the Fargos and the Wilmers and the and the, the Brainers and, and and that kind of thing, but. Uh, um, so the interstate's a big deal for these guys. All in there. He's on an evening shift now. He goes on midnights. But uh, if they can get with some of the other canines, uh, Sock Center uh, has got a very good drug dog that's done a lot of seizures. Um, they get with some troopers that are out west that uh, have some good dogs out there uh, on the west end, and they just do some interdiction stuff on the interstate, and they've been having some successes. So uh, the other two dogs that we got kind of side light to the whole thing. I got him filling while he's i go and get the dog, but we have a couple of bloodhounds, um, you know, uh, that just all they do is track their, their big kind of smelly, slobbery things, but uh, like the canine handlers that have them are good. Uh, um, the one is actually uh, on the uh, national FBI team, so you can call them if there's like a major, like if there's a really bad case, a lost kid, somebody was abducted or whatever, uh, I guess you can kind of think like a Jacob Wetterling type situation, the FBI would call uh, Calling them out, you have to go over to uh, Quantico once a year and certify with the dog. And they don't get any time to practice, they just land, show up, the next day they get a scenario and they have to do a track and it has to, it's like an all day long thing. So, um, very good dog. Uh, this morning we had a, a lost uh, autistic kid from the Belgrade Bruton High School. Didn't get off the bus and didn't go to school, he just walked by the bus drive, left his backpack and disappeared. So they called him out and uh, uh, he's actually a whole for the school resource officer, but uh, um, did a good job, you know, tracking. Ultimately, the trooper just found the kid and walking down the highway. But uh, so good, good end result to that scenario. But uh, so yes, we have uh, we don't have any bite dogs in the sheriff's office. There are some around. Uh, you know, when I say bite dogs, I guess they're patrol dogs, so they can track. And then if they have to apprehend at the end, uh, we do not have any in the sheriff's office. We just have the two bloodhounds and, and two dogs right now. So and we're actually <coughs> getting a, a puppy bloodhound here in the next month or two. So uh, just selected another handler. So uh, because I think our one is going <coughs> to retire after a couple of years here. So so that's a little bit about the sheriff's office canine program. So we'll just uh, wait for him to come unless there's some other questions about anything. Uh, you named a couple other agencies that have canines. Or how many do you know across? You know, there was a time where Stearns County kind of went down to almost nothing for canines. Uh, Wake Park was kind of a premier place to have canines, but uh, there's a lot of places that happen now. A lot of most of them, if you have a, a patrol dog, as they call it, uh, that can track people, you can cross train that to uh, to also look for drugs. Um, so, like Eddie, that's coming in here, we could train him to look for people. We probably couldn't train him to play. He's just too friendly. Uh, you know, 
and, and just, there's a different, not that they have to be mean, they're not mean dogs, they're, like, they're still friendly, you can pet them and stuff, but there's a different drive to them. So, um, but Wade Park has one, the Painsville's getting one, Sox Center has one, Wade Park's got one, St. Paul's got two or three. So. This is Eddie. Uh, he's the smartest dumb dog ever. <laughs> he's a big fellow, but uh, he does really good. Uh, so basically, whenever we go to look for anything, basically I tell him, find it, and he starts looking for stuff. Exactly what he'd do if he'd find anything in the locker. He'd just keep one in the lockers, and if he'd smell something, he would lay down, stop, and look at me and say, Hey, I found something, give me my toy. So it's uh, pretty easy. It's all driven on this ball that he has, and every time he does a good job, he gets it. And, and you'll lay down if you're out on a traffic stop on the industry, or yeah, the road, um, or inside the car, or whatever. It's always. Sometimes he'll get a little bit lazy and he'll just sit down, um, but it's the same <laughs> as him laying down. Uh, but otherwise, yep, every time he finds something, even for his size, he's a big dog. If he gets in a little two-door car, sometimes he can't lay down. Um, so he'll stop and look at me and he'll keep doing what he did there, just keep nosing what he's smelling, saying that, hey, it's right here. Pay me already. Give me my reward. So. And you get a workout when you come. <laughs> How often do you guys have to certify two of the canines that are uh, um, We certify once a year. Um, right now we're through the United uh, United States Police Canine Association. The last um, certification we did was down in St. Michael, Albertville. And going down to the cities, you get a lot more dogs that certify. And I think there were 190 dogs that went to the school over that two-day period to certify. And basically they kind of do the same thing as here. Um, they'll empty out, the classrooms are about half this size, um, and then they'll hide something in there. You don't know where it is, um, but basically you go in there and try and find it. So you have three rooms where you go in. Two of the rooms will have one drug item in them, and basically you gotta go through all three rooms and tell them which, which rooms have the drug item and where. Um, and it's kind of the same for cars. When you get involved with cars, they do five cars and they hide drugs on two of the cars, just one item, and then you gotta go through those, the outside of those five cars and try and find where they put that drug item. And you can fail too, right? Oh yeah. Um, a lot of the times, the, that's why I call them the smartest dumb dog ever. The dogs are really smart in their game that they play. A lot of times when they don't certify, it's up to the handler missing something. Um, missing a cue that isn't normal or just not paying attention. Um, the first time I certified with him, I missed one of the hides. That was completely my fault. It wasn't his fault at all. He found it, I just didn't pay attention to the right cues that he was giving off. Right. So when you're doing the search, there's never a time where the kids come in Right? The kids are all in class, you're going through the lockers and most, stuff. So if their kids were scared of dogs or stuff like that. Yeah, most of the times all the students are in classes. Um, we've ran into a few outside in the hallways that are trying to sneak between classrooms, bathrooms, uh, whatever. But that's why we get paired with a teacher or an office staff just to kind of act as a buffer. So if we see somebody out, they can grab them right away and say, hey, what are you doing out here? That way we can just kind of continue on with what we need to do. So it's usually whenever we go into school, we're always paired up with um, somebody. Well, any other questions? We'll um, put them away probably. Okay. Is he like your pet? Does he live in the house? <laughs> he comes he home with me. Um, I take care of him. 
feed him, run him. Uh, when I first got him, he had a lot more energy than this, and I wondered what I had gotten myself into. <laughs> um, I was going for a mile and a half run in the morning, a mile and a half run at night with him, and it's like, oh, I can't keep doing this. Um, but then we got uh, things settled down where I bike and he runs alongside me, so I get to cheat a little bit. But he just works with you, like he can't just go with um, anyone? He could get switched off to somebody else, um, but generally um, they will only switch a dog once just because then they start to get confused on who they're supposed to be with. Um, in the long run, I hope I get to keep him for his entire career, um, and then he'll get retired, and hopefully I can purchase him from the sheriff's office. Um, generally, they try to keep it with one handler um, just through their entire career, because there is a bonding that, you know, he kind of knows how I work through that training period, and then I know how he works. Um, like tonight, he did good in here, but I was kind of slow. If he's working on his own, he could cover this whole room in a minute or two, searching for what's in here. Uh, if there's nothing in here, he'd be right back at the door and we'd move on to the next room. Um, but you just kind of learn how each other's working styles um, go together. So you could train him. You could force him to another handler, but it's kind of a rough transition. What's his career length? Um, bigger dogs, because he is so big, it'll be a little bit shorter than normal. Um, most dogs, you have the kind of the seven year, for every, dogs age seven years for every one human year. But for him, because of its size, it's actually 12. Um, so that'll shorten his lifespan a little bit. Uh, but for him, they should be able to get eight to nine years out of, out of a work life for him as long as his hips and his body kind of holds up. He'd do this until he died. Um, you know, he's kind of like any dog that has a really high drive. They'll, they'll go until they tip over. Um, and that's just something that they're, it's their game that they play. Um, so as long as his body can hold up, he'll do it until he can't anymore. And what's the cost of one of the dogs? When we got our two dogs, we got them kind of as a package deal. Um, generally, for a drug sniffing dog, they're anywhere from seven to ten thousand dollars a piece. Um, that includes their training and everything with them. Um, so basically, once once they're trained, um, you know, it's equipment stuff, and you're on the road, and away you go. Um, we pushed for them because we noticed as patrol officers, we were seeing a lot more drug problems in the area, um, and it's just kind of another kind of a prevention or a threat that hey the county has drug dogs so we can you know try and work on and then battling some of the problems in this area. So yeah and I think a patrol dog the apprehension dog costs more. And yeah. then there's associated costs like a, a special squad car. He, he drives a squad car it looks like everybody else's but it's got a special cage in the back so it's like his little home away from home basically uh, so it doesn't look like a back seat of a squad car, it's more of a panel basically in the back. And uh, <clears throat> so that costs a little bit of money just to outfit the squad car. Uh, I don't know what else we do with our squad cars if we do uh, um, they emergency air conditioning and that kind of stuff. Yep. So if you, he's in there and it's 95 degrees out and you go into the restaurant and for some reason your car dies, there's no, I don't know. Do we have that? I don't know. Yeah, that. yeah. It's basically got temperature sensors in there, so if it gets too hot, it'll just automatically roll down the windows and turn on the fan to push air through the vehicle so he doesn't overheat. Uh, they have a lot more problems down in like southern uh, United States, Southwest, where it gets so hot, where if handlers don't pay attention and their car shuts off because it overheats, that'll end up killing the dog inside because they overheat in, inside of it. And I would say that the, you know, so he said seven to ten thousand, probably with the car and everything. It's probably about twenty thousand to work with the squad and train you and, and give yeah, you and I'd say so. fifteen to twenty thousand altogether. But it doesn't take long, honestly, if you, if, if he's out doing interdiction stuff to recoup that. Uh, you know, uh, we just had a traffic stop the other day. The guy had like sixty grams of meth, but he had five grand on. You know, so that's forfeitable funds that we can then put back into the program and stuff. So they kind of obviously pay for themselves. If you last seven to ten years, it's thousand dollars a year really to get the dog when you average it out. And um, and the drug dogs definitely you know they pay for themselves through the, the drug seizures and stuff. Uh, you know, what is a pound of meth right now? I don't even know. 
It depends. Um, between five thousand eight thousand. So. A pound of meth is eight thousand dollars. We got three pounds the other day. That's twenty-four thousand dollars of drugs. And that's cheap. When I was in the task force, it was like at twelve. So just because of the supply and demand, there's a lot of obviously a lot of meth around. So we can charge a lot less. So. And with this area of at ninety-four highway fifteen, highway ten, yeah. twenty-three, there are a lot of major highways that run right through here. And it's just, it seems like a lot of these stuff is now coming through this area, going to uh, different places in the state, the country, uh, Canada, all over the place. Any other questions? Or? All right, I'll get them out of here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, I, I mean, unless there's some other questions, then we'll just kind of draw the meeting to an end. But I, for the benefit, again, of the cameras and anybody that's going to watch, uh, certainly encourage you to come uh, next month. Uh, we are lining up a guest speaker. I don't think we've got anything confirmed, so I don't want to go out on a limb and say who it is. But uh, um, but we'll, you know, we'll, we'll definitely, uh, and we're going to start getting the students, I think, uh, more involved with us. Uh, you know, one thing that we talked about as a group is, to deliver the message to the kids. We're all of a bunch of adults, obviously. They're not necessarily going to listen to us. So we're, uh, the idea being that we kind of steer them and help them, but uh, it's going to be more of a peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, you know, as the target group and that kind of thing as far as delivering the message uh, uh, about, uh, you know, making the right choices and that kind of thing. So um, if you didn't sign up, please sign up on there so we can get you on an email list. Again, we're not going to get bombarded with emails, but you'll get some notifying you about the meetings, a reminder, that kind of thing. Um, you know, if other things are occurring, uh, you know, and certainly I encourage, uh, you know, businesses in Sartell, please come down and just, you know, if you're a business owner and, and partake in this, so that, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be a collaborative effort to uh, kind of reinvest in the community. So, um, leave it at that, unless there's some, something else. So, all right, thank you. Thank you. That's it? No, it's dogs are. Yes, they are. Oh, and if you anybody wants the actual policy for whatever reason, we'll have a table here. Just lose it on your porch. <laughs>